Thank you for downloading this episode of In Our Time. For more details about In Our Time and for our terms of use, please go to bbc.co.uk slash radio4. I hope you enjoy the programme. Hello. In 49 BC, a Roman army marched south from the Alps and crossed the Rubicon, a shallow river which marked the northern border of the territory controlled by the city of Rome. The army was led by a young general called Julius Caesar, and when he crossed the Rubicon, he ignited a series of civil wars that led eventually to the overthrow of the Roman Republic and the establishment of the Roman Empire. Julius Caesar could be the ultimate case study for the view that history is made by great men. He extended the borders of Roman power to the English Channel, introduced political reforms that echo down to the present day, and left accounts of it all that are considered high points of Latin literature. He is also famous for the manner of his death, murdered on the steps of the Senate in one of the most notorious political assassinations in history. But was Caesar a power-crazed tyrant or a visionary statesman willing to do whatever it took to see through much-needed reforms? With me to discuss Julius Caesar are Maria Wyke, Professor of Latin at University College London, Chris Pelling, Regis Professor of Greek at the University of London, at the University of Oxford, sorry, and mm-hmm. Catherine Steele, Professor of Classics at the University of Glasgow. So that's, we got the blooms out, the boobs, the boobs out of the way. I, think I would like to start this again, but it's live. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Maria, can you, Caesar lived in a period historians call the Late Republic. What was the state of Rome at that time? Well, Caesar was actually born in about um, 100, uh, 100 years before Christ, so in fact not quite so young when he crossed the River Rubicon. But he was growing up and maturing in the 90s and the 80s, and that was uh, perhaps the best of times and the worst of times for a man of his uh, gifts and his ambitions for power and fame to live. Um, it was the worst of times because he was born into a family that found themselves on the wrong side of um, a continuing struggle in the late Republic between the traditional um, ruling aristocracy and uh, the people. Um, In his first 20 years, he would have lived through violent clashes and sustained wars um, between Romans and non-Romans and between and even you mean between non-Romans, Romans. you don't mean in Rome, non-Romans I mean, in Rome. I mean people who lived in Italy yeah. but did not have Roman citizenship. Which was and most of them. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Rome, Rome as such is a relatively small part of the Italian peninsula. But the, these wars and these uh, violent struggles are taking place because um, there is a desire to gain access to the, the power and the wealth and the privilege that comes with being a citizen of the Roman Empire. And uh, when he was about 12, um, a general and leader of the um, aristocratic uh, party marched on Rome. When he was 17, that general became a dictator and attempted to restore the power of the Senate and slaughtered his enemies. And Caesar was vulnerable because he was one of that man's relatives, uh, relatives of one of that man's enemies, I should say. Uh, we're still talking about the Republic at this time, rather than about the Empire. Uh, and the Empire begins after the death of Caesar, although it might look like an Empire before then. Um, what sort of power was Rome? You, what power did he have at this time? Well, it was a state in the peninsula, and what else? Well, what I, one of the reasons why it was the best of times for someone like Caesar is because of the opportunity to be a general in um, the Roman world, because Rome was now also an empire. It was a republican empire, possessed provinces in other parts of the world. During this period, wars were being fought from Spain right over to Syria, from um, wars with uh, the Germans in the north down to Africans in uh, the south. This period being what? Because we've got to be specific here, because he comes (laughs) in at a particular moment and does particular things. So what is this period? Well, the period, as I mentioned, the 90s and the 80s. Back back when he was 10 to 20. Yes, yes. So in the period before he takes action, there are already So they're fighting to get an empire in different parts of what we now call Europe, even though they were only a small part of what we now call Italy. Yes, and they well they were growing and growing, and they already had provinces in, um, for example, in southern France. So they they didn't possess um, total. They they had allies in Italy. They had people in Italy who were not citizens, but they also had provinces. So Rome is expanding and expanding, giving citizenship out across the Mediterranean. So briefly, what 
impact did this empire have on this state? So you have a smallish state in the peninsula with empire burgeoning. Yes. What impact did it have on the feeling that that state had about itself? Well, that's a very good point because um, it's one. It's regarded as one of the reasons why, in the end, uh, the Roman Empire had such difficulties that as it expanded and expanded, it didn't have the uh, right kind of uh, concentrated um, administration to govern the huge territories that it was that it was now taking over. Catherine Steele, would you tell us more about Julius Caesar's family and its standing in Roman society and how that helped him? Well, the Julii Caesares were patrician um, in status, which means that Caesar could claim descent from the families that had been powerful in Rome even before the expulsion of the kings, and in his case, of course, descent back to Aeneas and through him to Venus. But... By this point, the, the late Republic, patrician status had ceased to be of any, of very much political consequence. Can I just be a little bit more Sorry. explicit about patrician mm. status? Did that mean they inherited property, inherited rights? What did it mean? Male line descent, no property essentially, no um, uh, particular political rights because from the um, uh, one of the, the great conflicts in the early Republic is plebeian struggle for political equality. So by this period, there's no political advantage to having patrician status. In many cases, it's a slight disadvantage. But it does mean you can claim um, dissent right back to the start of the Republic, and that still seems to have a cachet in political circles. How did he use that? Interestingly, he doesn't behave like a conventional aristocrat in many ways. He doesn't play hugely on his nobilitas, or at least he combines that appeal to the past with real populism. Maria has already mentioned his, his links with the opponents of Sulla, the dictator. His aunt, Julia, married Marius, who was, one of, who was a new man, no political background, no ancestry, but a great general. Um, who became a real hero in Rome at the end of the 2nd century BC by defe defeating the Celtic tribes. Um, his mother, Aurelia, was also of use to him because she was plebeian, but her, she had three brothers, all of whom reached the consulship, the chief magistracy, and it's protection from them that helped Caesar. So he combines <coughs> um, uh, dynastic cachet with um, new types of, of power to help him get a start in political life. There's much talk of this populism or what it does. Mm. Can you give listeners an indication now as to how, that, how, he, how he represented that, what he did about that? He emphasised his relationship with Marius. When his aunt Julia died, he gave a funeral speech which, which, which played on that. Where possible, he supported um, popular rights and laws in favour of the people. Such as? Um, in 63, he was behind a prosecution that asserted people's right to trial. That is not arbitrary execution. Big by, stuff. Yeah. By, yeah, by harking back to uh, yeah. um, uh, events some years in the past. And again in 63, when it came to the Catalinarian conspiracy, that coup against Rome, which the consul Cicero took such a part in putting down, it's Caesar who speaks against execution um, and almost sways the Senate debate. And that's a popular thing to do. Yes, because the basis of that is saying magistrates cannot exercise arbitrary power over citizens. Citizens deserve a trial. Was his? Do we know? Do we think this was a, a calculated reaching out for yes. a sort of party? It was. I think absolutely. Where's your evidence? Um, really, if one looks at the range of options he had, OK, he didn't have to become a populist. He could have followed a much more conventional career relying on oratory, relying on military success in order to build up towards high office. And he uses those tools. He is a good public speaker. He does take what opportunities he has for military service. But he's also doing some very distinctively populist things that you wouldn't expect and that his contemporaries aren't necessarily doing. What do we know about his personality in those early years? Well... Earlier years. <laughs> I mean... I think for a sort of man to take over half the world and cross the Rubicon, it can still be called a young general, but Maria thinks <laughs> not young in a real sense. OK, <clears throat> his early career, can we, can we get some before he becomes famous? It's awfully difficult because all our evidence about the young Caesar comes from later biographical writers who are writing knowing full well that he does become... Right, so everything's significant. I, I, I yeah, think well, Can you pick out a few things that you think are significant? In terms of... The real Caesar, or in terms of the telling of the story, I You're mean, you have the... to make that out for yourself. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> what do you think is important for us to know about the significance of his early li earlier life? 
deep distrust of um, uh, the Senate, I think, as a result of having been on the wrong side of the civil war between Sulla um, and Caesar. Um, some pretty scarifying experiences. He's on the run um, in his adolescence. He comes under pressure to divorce um, uh, his wife as a late teenager um, because she's on the wrong side. Um, so I think some... some uh, some fairly major trauma psychologically as a, as a relatively young man. Um, and I think it's from that, that that we can trace a lot of this this huge ambition and a sense perhaps that whatever Sulla did as dictator wasn't enough. I mean, as an, uh, shortly before his death, he's supposed to have said see, Sulla didn't know his ABC, by which he's assumed to understand Sulla resigned supreme power. Um, and of course, Caesar never did that. OK, Chris Pelling, we come to one, the first big defining thing about Caesar as the Julius Caesar uh, that, that handed down to us, the Gallic Wars. How did he get involved in them? Well, it may almost have been, not, not quite by mistake, but uh, not quite expected, uh, as uh, this all happens when he's consul, in some ways getting to the, the, the peak of a normal career in 59. Uh, and uh, the provinces that a consul would go on to were defined uh, before he becomes consul, in fact. And the, uh, it looked originally as if he was going to be going to Illyricum, uh, which is uh, in the Balkans. So when you get to be a consul, they say, you can have this territory as part of the job description. You can go on to that territory right. afterwards, and a province is your the, the area which you will uh, then have control of, and it can be a job to do as much as an area, and there was uh, talk of giving him a uh, what seemed to be a, 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 a very unlucrative and unprestigious job in Italy. But OK, if this initially became as then a lyricum, uh, but there's already the notion of at least some parts of Gaul, uh, but when the prospect of getting Gaul, uh, uh, which would originally be the, uh, the southern part of Gaul, already under Roman control, comes into play, he would have welcomed it. Uh, and uh, this is uh, where he, he, he launches. Gaul offered much more opportunity of glory, and it's, uh, it's, glory is uh, what an awful lot of this is about. So what did Italy own in Gaul, in Gaul at the time that he went there? It was uh, what was called the province, uh, which is uh, really the the, the very much, well, Provence, in a sense, is where it, where it comes from. Um, and a bit uh, up the Rhine. Uh, yeah, go, go. So, so the, the, the southern, something like a quarter, a third of France, I suppose. It, it obviously had connections with, the, uh, with uh, the, the rest of Gaul as well. There were traders going there. Um, there had been uh, a certain amount of trouble in Gaul in the last few years. Um, uh, in particular, there was now the notion of um, uh, one of these big troop movements, Catherine mentioned the Celtic uh, troop movements of the late second century BC. Uh, this is now the Helvetii um, on the move coming across uh, coming across Gaul, coming across France. Uh, and Caesar seeks, uh, really seizes the opportunity to, to confront those. Uh, and it ends in, well, actually one of the bloodiest afternoons in history. Uh, we, I mean, troop, uh, the, the actual casualty figures uh, are all... It's very difficult to know if they had accurate figures at all. They probably come back originally from placards carried at, uh, on his triumph. But there was talk of something approaching 100,000 dead, uh, probably at least very high five figures dead on the battlefield of, of Bibrac Day early in 58. This is, you know, a higher carnage than the first day of the Somme. Uh, and uh, it goes on like that. The, the final numbers were probably over a million dead. Uh, and that's over a pretty high proportion of a male population of, 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 of Gaul. It was, it, it, it was a bloodbath. And he kept winning, didn't he? And he kept taking these... Uh, he did. Can you just give the listeners some idea of how much territory he took over in Gaul and how important that was for the future of Rome? Uh, a lot. Um, and really all of what we, what we now call as France. Uh, his technique was to um, find a, a reason, often an excuse, uh, to penetrate fairly deep into uh, the 
un, uh, as it were, unconquered territory, uh, win a victory you know, as far up as, as Belgium in, in, in the, uh, the, the second year of his command, and then uh, proclaim the territory behind as now pacified and expect the, the tribes in those areas to, uh, to um, submit. And if they didn't, they were called rebels, even if this was really the first, uh, the first encounter they'd have. And we're talking about a period of years, aren't we, and during which he wrote his commentaries, his famous seven volumes, uh, his own view of his exploits, which, which we could talk about later, as may or may, but obviously self-serving, but how self-serving is another matter, but these are remarkable documents. Well, they are, and uh, there's some dispute about how they, they got back to Rome. Some people think it was written by book by book and sent back every every year. Some people think it's more yeah, of a feast. but there they are, yeah. But there they are, and it's, it, it is, again, his, his claim for glory, written in that very distinctive third person, which when Shakespeare comes over, sort of Caesar shall go forth. Danger knows full well that Caesar is more dangerous than he. It's, it's aping that third person quality. Uh, and it... it uh, I mean, the effect of that is, is, is remarkable. It's quite difficult to say exactly what it is, but you certainly get the idea of Caesar, the all-knowing general, and Caesar, the all-knowing narrator. They, uh, they sort of feed off one another, and he, in a way. Called it, didn't he call it the wars in Gaul? Is that the... It's probably his commentary. It's, uh, it, it's um, the... Uh, the <laughs> it's his own memoirs, as it mm. were, um, and which will be at least based on the accounts he'd given to to the Senate. It, it won't be the exactly the same form, but it apes some of those sort of war communique type of forms at some point. And Maria Wyke, so this man is turning into a military monster in Gaul for many years. He crosses Oceania, the... Uh, the, the outer sea, Mediterranean, the inner sea, Oceania, the outer sea, and comes to Britain. Uh, nothing much to be gained here, so he goes back uh, <laughs> after saying Veni Vidi Vici, which turned into a song. And um, oh, That was the then, morale section. Yeah, <laughs> and then um, while he's away, obviously the political situation in Rome is developing quickly, partly because yes. of the power of these massive generals with their great yes. armies. Can you tell us more, something about Pompey and his opposition to Caesar back in Rome? Absolutely, and one of the reasons that Caesar was writing the commentaries that Chris was talking about was precisely because he needed to send back to Rome uh, information that indicated what magnificent things he was doing for the benefit of the people and, and the state. That needed to be known because all these years he's absent from Rome. So his his um, problem is that being absent, he needs networks of alliances to support his political interests because ultimately the generalship is not something he wants to do for life. He wants to come back to Rome. He wants to be a consul again. He wants to take on power in the heart of the empire. And how, is, how does he see Pompey as his, as his great rival while he's away in Belgium and Britain and... Well, interestingly, to begin with, just before he goes to Gaul, they enter into an alliance where they unite their, their networks of supporters to enable them to both achieve the things that they want to. They have an additional um, character, Crassus, who provides pretty much the money uh, for the three of them. And uh, Pompey joins um, hands with Caesar, if you like. In fact, he marries uh, Caesar's daughter to... Um, um, strengthen this union uh, because he came back from a whole series of fantastic victories in the East and then found that the Senate was refusing to fulfil the decisions that he had made there. So he joins with Caesar. That lasts for a few years. They renew their alliance partway through the period that Caesar is in Gaul and he is able to renew his command there. But then Julia, the the woman who unites the two of them together, dies in 54. And Pompey by then is beginning to extract himself from his relationship with Caesar. Catherine Steele, the, 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 behind this, the tectonic issues behind this, uh, these men are getting colossal armies and they're Roman citizens in a republic are thinking these men are a threat to the Republic of Rome because of their great armies. So we're not ever letting them back into Rome with the armies. They've got to leave the armies and come into Rome and be ordinary enough citizens, whatever it is. This is the fight, and these people don't want to. They want some, most of the books. He's a particular wants to bring his army with him. Now, it's the biggest demonstration of that, and it's a phrase we all now have, in 49 BC, Caesar crossed the Rubicon. Now, how important was that for him and for Rome and for the state of the Republic? 
hugely important, particularly on a symbolic level. Can you just tell us what the Rubicon is? The Rubicon is a small river which marks the boundary between Italy and Cisalpine Gaul. Um, Cisalpine Gaul is part of modern Italy, but it's Gaul this side of the Alps from a Roman perspective. Caesar had legitimate military authority in Gaul. He did not have legitimate military authority in Italy. So the act of taking his army across the Rubicon into Italy, that's war. It's crucial, isn't it? It's absolutely crucial. It's you are not going to stop us being a democrat... No, a, a, a republic. Yes, but not everybody is opposed to Caesar in 49. Not everybody wants war. What is interesting about the, the manoeuvrings which lead up to 49 is it's a relatively small faction in the Senate who are completely intransigent. And when it finally comes to a vote in, in late 50, um, there's a vast majority, even within the Senate, who want peace, who want both Pompey and Caesar to disband their armies. By that point, neither Pompey nor Caesar is going to pay any attention to that. But we need to remember that, that Pompey is at the heart of a relatively small faction even within the Senate. And Caesar has a great deal of popular support um, uh, in 49. So there we come to the beginning of the Civil Wars, Chris, uh, Chris Pelling. Um, now then, can you just give us some idea of the power, the, the force of that and how it was initiated? Well, it's uh, as, as, as Catherine said, there's a tremendous movement for, for peace. And uh, there's a lot of things that can still happen uh, in those last days. We're before talking war about break. 50, 49, 50. This is the last days of 50. Yeah. Uh, I mean, Pompey uh, has, uh, is now with the with the senatorial faction, uh, but they must have known they uh, would find it, it, uh, it was difficult to rely on him. After all, there, as Marie had mentioned, there was a time when Pompey had, had come back to Caesar, um, and uh, they had not treated Pompey very well in the past. There were all sorts of options still on the table. Why hadn't they treated him very well? In what way? Oh, this was, uh, again, as you were saying, uh, Melvin, when, they, um, uh, when he, uh, the returning general, coming from great moments of glory in the East, uh, uh, and coming with an army, and this is back in the late 60s, and he had uh, disbanded his army rather than holding Rome to ransom, uh, with the expectation that his army would uh, get land, would get settled, that he would get proper uh, um, uh, appreciation, and had been really stabbed in the back. That's why he'd had to come in with Caesar in the first place, back in the consulship, to get land for his own veterans. Pompey had no great reason to be gratitude to, be, to, to be grateful to these people. Uh, so there was lots of things on the table back there. Uh, the intransigence, Catherine was mentioning, they wanted to force it. Uh, they wanted to make their case that even if you're Caesar, just as ten years earlier, even if you're Pompey, you can't hold the, 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 uh, hold Rome to ransom. Uh, they, were, they were anxious to, 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 to force it. They had their general in their pocket, but they were, they were lucky that Pompey was with them. Anything could happen still. But OK, uh, they did force Caesar's hand, probably to go further than um, he wanted to, but not than he was prepared to. He crosses a Rubicon, we're into civil war, and you know, as we're all saying, this is an absolutely massive move. It's a massive, and just so he crosses the Rubicon, and the Romans say, you can't do that. So, so do they call on... Pompey to oppose him, is that a declaration of war on his part, in effect? Well, again, there's, there's lots of peace moves, even in the, uh, in the first month of January. Uh, all things are still on the table, but yes, it is effectively now war. So what does he do now? Well, uh, what, uh, well, Caesar. What Caesar does, <coughs> he moves very quickly. Uh, Pompey has got to recruit new troops. Caesar has got his own battle-hardened veterans. He's moving down. Uh, by March of 49, um, Pompey has decided, very controversially, that he's going to abandon Italy. He's going to move east. Uh, as so often, Roman civil wars end up by being fought in, in, in Greece or Macedonia. Uh, one side goes east. Uh, then uh, the rhythm of the things is that it's, it's all fought out on the Greek um, Greek mainland or somewhere around there. It all then leads up to the uh, the battle, the first big battle, not the only big battle of the civil war, which is Pharsalus in in forty eight, and um, Caesar wins that, uh, it, perhaps unexpectedly. Uh, it could easily have gone both ways. In some ways, by that up to that point, Pompey and his troops, even though they were less experienced than Caesar's, was having the better of a campaign. He was outmanoeuvring Caesar. Uh, Caesar was desperate to force a battle. He does manage to force it, uh, or Pompey allows it for whatever reasons at Pharsalus. On the day, it goes Caesar's way. It could easily have gone the other way. 
and Maria Wyke, the Civil War, they hound each other through the embryonic, fairly new Roman world, uh, including Caesar spending a spell, nine months or something, in Egypt. That's right. He, he pursues Pompey, who has fled the battle. Um, Pompey tries to get refuge in Egypt. When Caesar arrives, he finds that Ptolemy the Thirteenth has delivered the head of Pompey to him as a gift, and Caesar is said to have wept at such an ending to such a great man. But then he stays in Egypt for nine months, and um, here we learn about a rather different sort of Caesar. We've spoken about Caesar the general and the statesman, but he was also known as uh, extremely extravagant and rather debauched. Uh, he was a collector of gems and of mistresses. He um, was um, described as every man's woman and every woman's man. And here he arrives in Egypt. He settles in the royal palace of Alexandria and finds that he is in the middle of a conflict between Ptolemy the Thirteenth and his um, sister wife Cleopatra, who has been thrown out of the palace. So and then it's pure Hollywood, isn't it? Well, then it gets I mean, really is good. Is it true that she <laughs> turned up? Is it true yes. that she went across in a skiff and got in a back entrance palace, and her servant carried her in a carpet yes, bag? Yes, yes. Think all Elizabeth true, Taylor. Just, it's just I great. Absolutely, <laughs> I thought they'd made it up, but no, they copied so, it from what really. She got well, out of the carpet bag. He fell for her and wouldn't leave for yes, nine months. So well. Chris well, Panning wants to protect her. <laughs> well, she is, uh, tw- she is revealed from this bag. She is um, about 22, uh, a real aspirant to power. She wants to get rid of her, her brother um, and extremely clever. He's now in his later 50s, uh, perhaps a little jaded. Um, we are told... Well, not that jaded. No, we'll, well cause clearly not, because uh, we then have stories of love, uh, endless banquets a tourist trip up the River Nile, the birth of a boy called Caesarian. All this happens in the ninth-month period. Scholars do speculate that um, he might have stayed there for nine months, not because he was distracted by love, but because Egypt was immensely wealthy, had been on the side of Pompey, and Caesar needed to reclaim it. But that's, that's the other version. You must allow Chris's interruption. Oh, I'm fascinated by carpets. Uh, <laughs> it's Cleopatra and the carpet. Um, uh, and Maria carefully said bag, um, and that, that I'm afraid is right. What, what the original makes it clear, what it is in fact, is it's a sort of kit bag, actually. It's um, a sort of the, uh, the word is what's used for the sort of kit bag that a sailor or soldier would put their straw um, bedding in and uh, throw on the ground, throw the bedding on the ground, then throw the, the, the bag on top of it. Uh, and um, uh, this was these, these bags were quite big. We, we, there's stories of people being smuggled in them elsewhere. Now, where does carpet comes from? Uh, it in fact comes from a an 18th century translation of uh, of Plutarch, um, where carpet is being used in a, a fairly obsolescent sense. Even there, it's of a throw. It's a sort of thing that you throw on top of a, a bed or on top of a table, uh, just as they would have thrown that on top of a bedding. And so carpet. Was, but it very quickly got misinterpreted as being carpet, as, as we would think it. Well, much as and I I'm hate to take the, the romance much, out of it. Much as I'm enjoying the digression on, <laughs> on your erudition on carpets, I think, I think if we turn back to Caesar at this oh, point... Well, right. I'm so <laughs> despoiled for you. Uh, Catherine, can you... He won the Civil War, Caesar. Yes. Right. Now then, why did he win the Civil War? He could keep going longer than anybody else. Um... I mean, See, one already... of the things in your notes, can I just check mm. on and then you talk, is that you keep saying close, close run battle, close thing, mm. but he always wins. Yes. <sighs> Not everybody expected to him, to him to do, but I think Chris has, has mentioned the key point, which is he had an army who he'd been working with for eight years. Um, very loyal veterans, but also very experienced. And that depth of experience, the Pompeian side, the senatorial side, had great difficulty in matching. What is striking, however, is the, their ability to keep regrouping. They are defeated in Greece in 48. The survivors flee to Africa. This set is up Pompey it, survivors, yeah. Pompey survivors yeah. um, flee to Africa, set up a new base there. Cato the Younger, um, one of their leaders. Caesar has to follow them to Africa... Um, he wins that battle, but again, he cannot destroy the senatorial faction. They move to Spain, set up base there. He has to pursue them to Spain. Big climactic battle in 45. And we often think that's the end of the Civil War, and that's the point at which Caesar 
goes back to Rome and it's its last campaign. But Pompey's younger son, Sextus, survives even the Spanish campaigns um, and continues as a focus of Republican resistance, if you like, for best part of another decade. So let's bring the Republic uh, notion back into it, Maria. So these, these two men are fighting each other, as it were, um, for, for supremacy. Well, that's what they're fighting for. It's a civil war. How's the Republic sitting in Rome, looking out over the barricades, thinking, I wonder what's going to happen to us? Well, I think there's a great fear about the consequences of um, this conflict. I think there's a fear also, a recognition among senators um, that Rome is changing, that Rome is uh, losing its republicanism, that, that these generals have uh, taken, um, taken Rome over and that loyalty now is not loyalty to the state but to your general. Um, and so there is a real anxiety when um, Caesar comes, and he goes too because he keeps on campaigning um, all the time from 45 through to his assassination and is surrounded by unelected advisers. He um, gets himself made a dictator, which is actually a rather different term, just to be another academic issue here about bags and carpets. Dictator is not quite what we think of it today because dictator then meant um, a, a nominated leader who could take control, have absolute authority, no veto over them, in a short period of crisis. But then they have to step down. So what Caesar does is he gets himself elected as a dictator, nominated, I should say. You know, that looks like it's still part of Republican strategies. But then later he becomes a dictator for a year, later again for more years. Eventually he's declared dictator for life. And it's at these points that senators see quite how Rome is changing. And he starts an unambitious project of, of reform, so, which ties in with what you were saying about his earlier uh, intentions, calculations, ambitions to look after the people. Yes. I'm not sure we can quite talk of a programme of reform in a systematic fashion. It's not quite the same as what Sulla does to entirely reshape the Republic back in 82-81. But there's certainly a lot of legislative activity in this period. Some of it is, is responding to immediate pressing problems. Money supply, debt relief, um, settlement of veterans. Those are all issues that Caesar can't evade. He has to do something about them. But there are longer term planning. There's a major reform of the calendar, um, there is, as Maria was mentioning, um, changes to how the Senate works. Part of that is pragmatic. The empire is now so big, you can't run it on the number of magistrates you used to have. So he raises the number of magistrates. That, in turn, makes the Senate bigger. So there's a, a good administrative reason for it. But, of course, a big Senate means lots of opportunities for patronage. Caesar also takes on the power of nominating magistrates. So a major assault on the principle of free elections. And that's a real change to Republican norms. Can we, and sorry. sorry, just one final point is a whole range of measures to make Caesar look distinctive within Roman politics, So, culminating in his becoming a god. But even before that, there's a huge range of ways in which he's made to look spectacular in terms of his attendance, um, costume and so on. Well, I'd like to come to the god in mm. a minute or two, but uh, Chris Pelling, uh, can we just explore... Not explore... Say a bit more about these reforms, these changes you wanted to make. How significant were they? And how planned were they? Um, I mean, did he mean to follow through, or was this just chucking out a sop? Was it bread and circuses? There's a certain amount of bread and circuses, um, uh, and uh, trying to ensure that the popular support, which has always been there, it remain, remain solid. How planned they were? I think Catherine's right, but it isn't a, a great single scheme to put things right. There are a lot of little schemes, uh, and some of them are bigger and longer-lasting than others. Um, some of them, uh, more of them are political in some sense than one might have expected. I think the calendar, even. Which Why do you we've... think the calendar's significant? Well, um, the calendar, the calendar was certainly in a mess. Uh, the uh, that uh, the by this time uh, the calendar, the monthly and yearly calendar, was um, something like ooh, a third of a year out. Um, the, the the number of days in the year in the calendar was about ten short, and this was handled by putting in into calorie months uh, at uh, uh, not at random intervals. Why but, did Caesar think this was a bad thing? Uh, well, it, it, they'd been managed for political reasons, but. 
that if you are a magistrate, you can uh, often welcome having a few extra months in your year to get things done, get things done in your interest. Sort of time um, off the year. And uh, certainly you may want to stop your opponent having extra time in his year. So it had become very politicised. Um, and Why uh, did he want to change it? Uh, well, partly, in a sense, actually, to take the politics out of it um, and certainly take the politics out of it for possible opponents. Uh, I think there is a certain amount of season of mind who just liked getting things right. And it had been known... For, uh, I mean, what was remarkable about the calendar was not the mathematics. I mean, it had been known for a long time what the num right number of years a uh, year was. But getting it all in such a way that uh, it would be regular and it would have some sort of concordance with a number of festivals in the year, so you didn't wreck all the traditional festivals, which were all booked to the calendar. Before we get to the death of Caesar, which is one of the most famous things about him, he became a god but not a king, Maria. Can you briefly tell us, for most of us nowadays, you think, well, the god's a bit <laughs> higher up than a king, so <laughs> how did that work? Well, in the Roman world, king is much worse than god. Um, king, king is there, there are such things as living gods. Um, you could see them around in different parts of the empire. In in the Greek East, they were used to having monarchs who were also a divine, as was Cleopatra. But king was a completely different thing because the whole sort of legend, the whole myth about Rome was that it had been founded as a kingdom. Romulus was a king, but then the kings had been expelled and the republic was born through the ancestor of Brutus who had killed the last king. Rome could never have a king again. And the big mistake that well, one of the mistakes that Caesar seems to have made is not just to take on some of the attributes of a god, but to take on the attributes of a king. So he um, was given the honour of being at official ceremonies, being able to wear the old ceremonial clothing of a king, a purple cloak, long red boots, a laurel wreath, which incidentally he liked because it covered his baldness. But he um, had all these features that looked as if he was aspiring to kingship. And then the key, there are key events leading up to the assassination that are moments when it looks as if he is aspiring to kingship quite publicly. And, the, and perhaps the last and the most well-known, the moment when we hit our Shakespearean play, is the Lupercal, the um, fertility festival, where three times Mark Antony tries to put a diadem on his head, which is a laurel wreath with white ribbons in it, a sign of monarchy. And three times Caesar refuses it because the crowd are crying out against it. Is that it, Chris Spelling? Is that the key reason for the assembled uh, uh, friends of his uh, to assassinate him on the Ides of March in 44 BC? I think kingship is is very important. I mean, it's a bit unclear exactly what is happening at that Lupercalia episode. Um, uh, perhaps he's... Uh, well, actually... were there, well, the other reasons why he was unpopular and they were against him by that time... Um, they, uh, it depends who these they are. It yeah. looks as if the, uh, it's, it's quite widespread. Um, it's not just a few people in the Senate. It's, uh, it's people to, talking about 60 or 80 people, probably in, in quite a lot of upper class uh, society. Um, it was, uh, the, uh, the, again, some of the intransigents uh, were still intransigent, uh, certainly the trampling on Republican sensibilities. Uh, you can see him trying to define his his position, as, uh, as we were saying, trying to define his own place within that state, uh, and it was going to be a special state. It was certainly offending those, those sensibilities. Uh, and um, uh, perhaps he was making a display at the Lipicalia of not wanting the crown, but even so, there was so much damage by then. It does look as if he was pretty uncompromising, striking a pretty uncompromising note in those early months of '44, and he was getting it wrong. Catherine Steele, how did the assassination... Was the assassination a turning point in Roman history? No, I don't think it was. Um, the assassins thought that it ought to be. They thought they could re-establish the Republic and that that is what would happen. Um, but the, the move towards autocracy had gone too far. Caesar had men around him who thought they could be the next Caesar. And Antony, who was the other consul, Mark Antony... Um, uh, uh, the, one of the consuls in 44 immediately moves to try and claim Caesar's position. He takes Caesar's papers and cash box and asserts his authority as the sole surviving consul. Caesar has a great nephew who pops up 
That's um, the man we know as Octavian, but he was very keen to call himself Caesar. 19. Yes. Um, Quite a boy. Yes. <laughs> so you have a period of, of, of a year, at least, in which individuals who want supreme power are grappling with the Senate, trying to work out what the next way forward is going to be, and it turns out to be more and more civil war. And ends up with an emperor. Now, we've got a few minutes left. Can you give listeners some idea of what you think he, his character is like? We've talked about him in action, in circumstances, moving through this or that battle. What, what, how would you describe him? Starting with you, Chris Bowie. Decisive and uh, uncompromising. Um, very shrewd. Uh, knew, what, knew what he wanted, uh, whereas Pompey was prepared to make compromises with the opposition, wanted to be, uh, would have been very happy to be accepted as number one in a grateful state. Caesar wasn't prepared to make that sort of compromise. Always sure of himself, you would say. Yeah, yes, certainly. Maria, what about you? Well, it's always hard to say good things about Caesar because you always feel you're then on the side of all the Tsars and the Kaisers and the Napoleons and the Mussolinis, but one has to admire his ruthlessness, his uh, sharp focus, his utter charisma, uh, the way that he could pull in loyalty and keep loyalty and uh, the speed with which he was able to achieve everything that he decided to do. Speed seems a key thing, doesn't Absolutely. it? His army moved faster than anybody else's army. He seemed to outthink people as much as outgun them. Well, outspear yes, and, them. Yes, and in his, uh, in his commentaries he often says Caesar arrived unexpectedly <laughs> because he got there so much quicker than everybody else in, in everything that he did. But you have to be shocked by the, the cruelty he exhibited, and I think it's very important to understand that what he did in, in Gaul was genocide. Yes, of the Celts. Of the Celts, yes. Yes, that's a terrible thing to do. What about you? Catherine? The radical, <laughs> radical intellectual grasp um, that the Republic as it um, stood wasn't working and that he could take advantage of that and supre seize supreme power. Um, he wanted to be king. He wanted... It's interesting... Or at least he wanted to be autocrat. He yes. wanted to be number one. He wanted to be number one, yes. I'm slightly intrigued by this notion of luck because Napoleon wrote about it, didn't he? Mm. Napoleon famously said, what I want in ge my generals is luck. Mm. And Caesar seemed to carry luck with them until the Ides of March. Well, that'll do then. OK, thank you very much indeed. <laughs> Next week we're going to talk about the Battle of Talos in seven, 751 when the Arabs fought the Chinese for the first time. Thanks for listening. And the In Our Time podcast gets some extra time now with a few minutes of bonus material from Melvin and his guests. Actually, I, just, I think that was a, a wipeout of such an amazing civilization, wasn't it? And yet he wrote very nice, very well about the sort of Celts when he was in, about talking about the British, wasn't it? How he admired their, how he admired their, their poets, how, how he, as, as I understand it, it's a long yes. time since I read it, he urged on them to, remember, to write things down because memory wasn't enough, but they wouldn't write things down. Am I on the right lines? Or have I read some goofy piece that I shouldn't have read about yeah, Caesar here? Well, he was, he also talks about the the Gauls. I mean, sometimes it's quite interesting that one of his rivals, Vercingetorix, um, seems not dissimilar to him in that the way he's discussed is in terms of someone who who, who united many many different tribes and generals, but uh, aspired to too great an authority. And so his his rival in Gaul is is a little bit like him, and they're kind of. As as the war proceeds, they're they're sort of chasing each other around different parts of the of the country. So he has he has admiration, and he's he's aware of the uh, the skills and the the power that some of the Gauls have. What we never got onto, how much do you think his commentaries were self-aggrandizing propaganda, and how much do you think he's giving us a perfectly acceptable, semi-objective overview? It's both, isn't it? I mean, they're not going to be credible works if they are if they contain obvious falsehoods. Yeah. And the oh, right, course, yeah. um, the apparent objectivity. I mean, you're you're absolutely right, Chris. Surely it has to do with how you present material to the Senate, the objectivity of a general reporting. But at the same time, they are massively tendentious in what yeah. they leave out. Particularly, I think the Bellum Kiwile. Um, where there's some jiggery pokery about how chronology is presented in the early months to make it look as if Caesar's more of a more keen on peace than he probably was, there's um, kind of very um, critical presentation of his opponents in the Senate to make them look like um, 
stupid warmongers who are trampling on the people's rights. Um, but the other thing about the um, his writings that always strikes me is the extent to which he actually can let the objectivity slip and write very moving stuff. I think here of the death of Curio at the end of book two of the Bellum Key Willer. Mm. Um, that's one of his young lieutenants who goes to Africa and makes a complete mess of the campaign and is slaughtered to the last man. And it's written with such pathos, combined with the objectivity of his, his style. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think it's important that he doesn't have total control, total uh, monopoly over the flow of information, even from yes. Gaul. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, he was put on the spot in the Senate because of uh, one particular bit of, uh, of facelessness to um, in, in, in reneging on a deal. And again, the intransigence, Cato was saying, we ought to follow an, an ancient Roman custom, give him up to these tribes. Mm-hmm. Um, he hasn't been able to prevent that getting back. And there were people on his own side, famously Labienus, who um, uh, is, 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 is his number two, really in an important way, who went over to Pompey, um, who felt that eventually the claim of a republic was greater than him. So he couldn't rely on total loyalty, though he clearly had a charisma that commanded tremendous uh, enthusiasm among his own men, but he couldn't control everything that went back. So he couldn't get away with saying just anything. But yeah, there's, uh, and indeed, even in a sense, the actual creation of Gaul is is, is part of a tendentiousness. Mm. The feeling that Gaul is a unit, with a Rhine as one firm boundary. So German are different. Um, Britain's are different. Okay, Britain's may well have been different. Uh, so you've got uh, the tremendous achievement of, 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 of uh, conquering one great thing, Gaul, and get a few extra bonus points as well for going even further, crossing a Rhine, getting into Britain as well, going beyond the bounds of, uh, of, of what you've done to go get even more glory. I didn't get a sense of his ferocity from... He must have been a ferocious man, mustn't he? I mean, he was... I mean, well, extremely, you know, the, extremely this, ruthless, yes, of course, especially just, on the yeah, battlefield, yes. but clever as well, because yeah. one of the striking things politically that he did... Um, oh, with, Tom's here, sorry. so we're officially at an end. Here's Victoria, so we can keep talking, but now we're officially at an end. <laughs> oh, okay. There are many more Radio 4 arts and discussion programmes to download for free. Find these on the website at bbc.co.uk slash radio4.